going with foreign senior, senior pol foreign policy advisor for former Minister Netanyahu, Carolyn Glick. Welcome back to First Edition. Always great to have you. It's always great to be with you. Thanks for having me back. Of course. Great. So Daniel Cohen just told us that the IDF expects to have full operational control of Rafa in two weeks as it pushes to destroy Hamas. What happens leading up to that and what could happen shortly thereafter? Um, well, you know, we've been running into difficulties in Rafa because the United States is micromanaging all of our operations and trying to uh, stop our progress or or uh, slow it down as much as possible. And so we've been fighting uh, on office and offense and defense simultaneously, which places all of our forces in danger, which is why we lost 16 uh, soldiers, including 12 in Rafa in the past week. Um, and so I think that in order for us to complete the execution of the mission and destroy Hamas's remaining f conventional forces in Rafa, we have to stop uh, playing uh, by rules that no military in history has ever had to play by and simply go out and end Hamas's uh, uh, military battalions. And uh, so I think that that's the most important thing that has to happen. But we have to recognize two things. One is that when we're able to uh, destroy the remaining battalions of Hamas that are located in uh, Rafah, that isn't the end of the war either in Gaza or in general. We're, we're now looking to the north and we're going to face a much more difficult uh, military challenge there uh, going forward. We already are. Right. Well, Israeli right. officials are saying Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has disbanded the influential war cabinet whose job it was to steer the war in Gaza. The disbanding coming a week after opposition lawmaker Benny Gantz quit over how he believed the war is being handled. What does this mean for Netanyahu going forward? Um, it stabilizes his coalition. The war cabinet was established upon the demand. It was a demand of Benny Gantz for entering into an emergency government with Netanyahu in October that there be this cabinet, which didn't exist before, formed, uh, and that he would have, uh, as a result, uh, major influence on the way that the war was being waged, because the war cabinet would make the day-to-day -day decisions and only strategic issues would be left to the constitutive body for making uh, war making decisions, the uh, National Security Cabinet. So now the powers just devolved back to the National Security Cabinet, and that's going to stabilize Netanyahu's governing coalition, because it had been a thorn in the side of the senior ministers in the government that uh, uh, the price for bringing Gantz in was denying them uh, their seat at the table, which they earned in the elections. And so now I think that, that the move is going to stabilize uh, the, uh, the government uh, pretty significantly. Well, if uh, I'm hoping that Israel will actually gain full control of Rafa in that two-week time period, and let's assume that it does. Uh, but at the same time, as you pointed out, Carolyn, if the Israeli Hezbollah war heats up, do you think Biden will change the narrative in the support, uh, in the positive direction toward Israel concerning Hezbollah as well as other international allies? And the truth is that it has to heat up because the status quo as it stands right now is unsustainable from an, from an Israeli perspective. The Americans are absolutely adamantly opposed to Israel doing anything to undermine or to diminish Hezbollah's power in Lebanon and their control not only over the border with Israel on the Lebanese side, but through their projectile war on Israel. They have operational control over northern Israel because they can hit any site that they want to within uh, a radius of, you know, several dozen kilometers from the border with Lebanon. And that's an unsustainable situation. We can't uh, bring our 80,000 internal refugees that have been displaced from their homes since October 7th home uh, until we've pushed Hezbollah away from the border. And that's not going to be done in any sort of an agreement with this uh, terrorist army. It's only going to be done uh, by by use of arms. So that means that the Biden administration opposes something that Israel has to do in order to secure its uh, survival. Mm -hmm. 
Well, the Biden administration um, released a statement, a fact sheet on conflict-related sexual violence, which excluded the brutal violence that happened to women on October 7th, women and children. Can you talk a little bit about that and um, why you think that they completely just overlooked what occurred um, that we all know to be true? I, I think that uh, the, the uh, decision by the White House to not make any mention of the most heinous, violent, organized, premeditated sexual violence that Hamas and the Palestinians that invaded uh, Israel with Hamas on October 7th carried out against our women and our girls and our boys and our men that day uh, is a horrifying a, a hor horrifying move on their part, uh, and it and it speaks to almost a bottomless hostility. I mean, it, it goes against everything that uh, we've heard from uh, feminists from the Biden administration about believing all women, and mm -hmm. they're saying believe all women unless they're Jewish. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it's it's anti-Semitic actually. Not putting that into the report is an act of profound hostility against Jewish people, not only the, the, the Jewish victims on October 7th, but Jewish people in general. And, and uh, it's breathtaking in, in, its, in its nastiness. I, I can't even believe that it happened. I mean, I, I saw the report and I, I still, I can't get my head around it. I've never seen something so, so viciously anti-Semitic emanating from a, from a White House as this. It, it's, it's, it's gratuitous and it's, it's mean. Completely agree with you. Definitely mean. Um, let's continue in that same vein with regard to the hostages. There's approximately 120 hostages uh, still um, being held in captivity by Hamas, 80 of which are believed to be still alive, 40 dead. Um, but we want all, to, all 120 back. What is the plan for the hostages? What is the timetable? Do you think this pause and all these other changes of late will help bring some type of negotiation to get the alive ones back and the bodies of the de deceased? No, no, not at all. I mean, I think one of the things that we've, we've lost sight of is who, his, who Hamas is, who, who, who we're supposed to be negotiating with. We're supposed to be negotiating with monsters. We're supposed to be negotiating with sadists. We're supposed to be negotiating with rapists and with baby killers. These people don't care about uh, the lives of the people of Gaza. They say so openly. They're willing to fight to the last Palestinian if that means that they get to annihilate the Jews. So this is a this is a pact with the devil that doesn't even have the, you know, the savoir faire of uh, Mephistopheles and Faust. I mean, th this is. These people are, are just, they're just sadists, they're monsters, and you think that you're going to cut a deal with them that's going to leave you alive? You're crazy. I, I mean, they just showed us who they are. The, the idea that anybody's treating them as responsible actors is preposterous. And on that point, you know, there was a report last week that the United States is carrying out independent negotiations with Hamas for the release of the Americans held hostage, which means that you know, the Americans are, are treating Israel even worse than Hamas because they're doing this behind Israel's back and any concessions that the United States gives Hamas will be on Israel's back because, mm -hmm. you know, Hamas isn't going to give anybody for free. America paid over a billion dollars per hostage to get, I think, five American hostages out of Iran. How much are they going to pay Hamas? And how many Jews are going to be killed as a result of that ransom payment, if that's all it is? And and so, you know, yeah, I think that people have misplaced, they've forgotten, or they've gotten confused about the importance of the, of the identity of your negotiating partner. They're so keen to get a deal that they forget that they can't get a deal with these people, because all these people want is to kill all the Jews. Well, Carolyn Glick, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Carolyn Glick, former senior foreign policy advisor for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Always great to see you. Thank you. Always great to have you. Uh, always great to be on your show. Uh, Thanks yes, for having me.